so he's had a lot of real world real world experience and a few other things as well. Uh, he's uh, he's writing a book on peak oil, and which looks to be really really interesting. So he's going to give us he's going to take up the whole hour today. So he qualifies as a guest speaker, not as a presentation <laughs> because of, because of his expertise. And uh, when he leaves Johnson, he's going to head off to uh, to Chevron. So in any case, take it away. I'm looking forward to the talk. All right, thank you. Um, so. I'm Will Martin. This is uh, this is my lecture. We're going to be talking about uh, first of all just peak peak oil, and I try to get into uh, what peak oil is. Um, get some economics. Uh, talk about the economics that are at play here. Uh, get into what the current state of affairs is with the world energy markets. Um, then we'll talk about substitution. What's going to ha happen after peak oil? How we're going to switch over to alternative forms of energy. Um, go into the final frontiers of oil. Uh, and then talk about peak everything. So this is uh, the peaks of other non-renewable natural resources like peak gas, peak coal, peak metals. Um, and finally, what does this all mean for our society and, and what can you do? So it's a, I have a lot of slides. It's about a minute of slides, so we're going to have to hustle through this. So if you get a question, uh, just write it down and, and keep it to the end, and, and then we'll uh, do some Q&A at the end. Uh, so first of all, the, the scale of the problem. Um, right now, oil accounts for about a third of our world energy mix, which doesn't, doesn't sound like a lot, but we use it for basically everything. Uh, one way to think about this is, is every single thing in this room is either made of oil, was made using oil, or was transported here using oil, including us. Uh, we use oil for absolutely everything, uh, transportation, 81% of oil goes to transportation, so this is things like gasoline in your car, jet fuel in planes, bunker crew that, that ships uh, goods across oceans, and then everything, basically every commercial and industrial process uses oil in some form or fashion. Everything from the fertilizers um, that we use to grow crops to the pesticides and herbicides um, to explosives and pharmaceuticals and plastics and everything, basically everything around you is made out of oil. So for all intents and purposes, we are addicted to oil um, and there's really no good substitute for it at this point. So what is peak oil? Um, peak oil is the point at which you reach a maximum rate in daily uh, global production. So this is maximum rate in millions of barrels per day globally. Um, and this is really important to, to think about the rate versus reserve. So a lot of people, uh, when they talk about peak oil, start, start saying, oh, you know, there's, there's so much oil in the world. Look at tar sands, look at shale oil, look at you know, heavy crude in Venezuela. There's so much oil out there. But those are, those are reserves, that's not the rate of production. So the best, the best way to think about this is what's called the million dollar analogy. So let's say, you know, God forbid your, your uncle dies and he was, you know, your rich uncle, he ends up leaving you a million dollars. You know, this is amazing, you have a million dollars, but there's a stipulation that you can only take out a hundred dollars a month. Now you might be a millionaire on paper, but you're never going to live like a millionaire. And that's where we're at essentially with, with oil production is we have a lot of oil but really the issue is how quickly can we get it out of the ground? What's the rate of production we can have? And peak oil is, is the point at which we reach a maximum rate. And so when you're looking at oil fields, the average oil field roughly follows a bell-shaped curve where you uh, start drilling for the field, uh, start, start ramping up production eventually, it peaks, every single oil field peaks eventually, and then you get a, a slow decline afterwards. Um, or a fast decline, depending on what kind of field you're drilling. Now, what you can do is you can aggregate all the fields in a region together. So this is all of Alaska, this is all of Texas. And as you see, the, the peaks of the individual fields aggregate to become essentially the same bell-shaped curve. When you put those all together, you get a peak for an entire region like the United States, um, which peaked back in 1971. And adding offshore, adding Alaska, uh, they helped us increase the amount of production we were getting out, but they never got us back up to that peak rate. And so what you can do is you can look at the entire world, you can aggregate all of the, all of the oil fields in the entire world, and you get a production curve for the entire world. So this is just one estimate from one research firm. There's a lot of different estimates out there. Um, this is from Energy Files. They, they, this chart shows a, a peak in 2015. Um, with, with a slow decline afterwards. So this is just a way to look at what peak oil is globally, is you just can aggregate all, all the production peaks of all the fields worldwide. So let's do some economics. Uh, 
Um, what's happened since 2005 is globally we've essentially been on a production plateau. Oil prices have gone really, really high. I've gotten up to $147 a barrel, but production globally is essentially plateaued. And so if you look at the supply, you know, in the supply elasticity um, globally, this is the global supply elasticity for 2001 to 2005, and it's relatively elastic. What's happened since 2005 is we've gotten a pretty big spike in, in the elasticity. It's essentially become inelastic, and this is, rough, this is generally due to OPEC. OPEC supplies a, a very large portion of our oil globally, especially, and a very, very large portion of the export market for oil. Um, they've become far more inelastic with their supply, which means that globally, it, supply essentially has become more inelastic. And then demand, you know, as I said, we're addicted to oil. We use it for absolutely everything. Oil demand is very, very inelastic. So what happens is when you put these two together, you get a supply and demand curve, but you get a kinked supply curve. So this is inelastic supply at a certain point. This is essentially, as you try to ramp up production to a certain point, um, you run into a wall. And you, can, and you can think of it with peak oil, this, this curve is kinked, but then it shifts to the left. And at the same time, what you're getting is demand shifting to the right. So as you know, China starts developing more, they're, sell they're now the world's largest car market, selling 18 and a half million cars every year. Um, as, as they shift to the right, start uh, consuming more oil, as, as basically the whole world develops, as the United States gets out of our recession, uh, the demand curve shifts to the right. And what happens is you get a price spike because of the kinked supply curve. Um, so a little bit of an increase in, in supply demanded uh, causes a huge increase in the price. And what happens when, the, when, when you get this increase in the price, an oil price spike, is it, it causes uh, severe recessionary forces on our economy. So the, uh, I believe it was the St. Louis Fed did an analysis of the last 11 recessions, and they found that 10 of the last 11 recessions were preceded by a spike in the price of oil. Um, so what happens is oil prices go up, they essentially tank the economy, bring demand back down, oil prices go down, we recover from the recession, we get another oil price spike, and, and this is what's often referred to as the bumpy plateau um, after, after peak oil. Now, as, we, as oil gets more and more expensive, um, eventually we reach a point where it's, it's economic to substitute over for alternatives. So, uh, one way to look at this is th this is the this is one way to think about electricity. So let's say fossil fuel energy, coal. Let's use coal. It becomes more and more expensive as we deplete the resource, and eventually it reaches what's known as the grid parity point, which it's essentially the same price as renewable energy. So it's the same price as let's say wind. Um, at that point, because wind won't increase with price over time, it'll actually decrease with price over time. Eventually, you'll reach that substitution point, and you're better off just using wind to create your electricity, using renewables to create your electricity, than you are using coal. Um, I have a whole section about why this substitution isn't going to work at the pace that we need it to work. Uh, so let's get to that. So what's the current state of affairs of the world oil industry? Um, these are a whole lot of peak oil forecasts. And on the x-axis, you have the year of the maximum global production peak. So this is from uh, various agencies, everything from uh, University of Uppsala to OPEC and Shell. Um, a lot of people think we've essentially already reached peak oil. And as you know, you've seen with the uh, inelasticity of supply, since 2005, we've essentially been at a production plateau. So it is feasible that we're act actually at sort of the plateau of peak oil right now. Um, even the most optimistic you know, forecasts are within our lifetime will reach peak oil. Now, the really important thing is the y-axis. This is post-peak what's going to be the decline rate globally of oil production. Uh, and this is, it's really hard for people to wrap their head around compounding interest. So one of the best ways to think about it is, is a half-life. And you can just use the rule of 72 to take a, a compounding uh, percentage and turn it into something that's more meaningful. So if we get a 2% annual decline after peak oil, this would be a 35-year half-life. And being at half the rate of global production that we're at today 
would mean that we are using the same amount of oil that we used in 1959. And you know, meanwhile, we've added how many billion people to the planet, six billion people or something. So imagine trying to run our global economy on the rate of oil production that we had in 1959 with a few billion more people, essentially. That would be very difficult to switch over in 35 years to the, the types of, of substitutes that we need uh, to, to run, essentially, to keep everything going. If we get a 6% depletion rate, which some people are predicting, globally right now, according to the International Energy Agency, um, the global post-peak decline rate for all fields is 6.7%. So with new fields coming online, it'll be somewhere in that band. If we get a 6% global depletion rate after the peak, that means 12 years from now, we're going to have to live on the amount of oil that we had in 1959. Um, and that's that would be essentially catastrophic. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to substitute over fast enough to the other uh, forms of energy. So globally, many countries have already peaked. The United States is the most famous. Um, we peaked in 1970, 1971. Um, Norway's peaked. Mexico peaked um, recently in 2001 with their Canarel fields declining about 75% uh, from its maximum rate of production. Um, and also, this is an analysis done by International Energy Agency, they found that every single one of the world's mega fields, these are the world's largest fields, every single one has peaked. Um, this is according to the EIA. And from their production peak, they're just over uh, where they were at, at their uh, peak. So we're, we're essentially declining off of these fields. The most famous right now is Canarel. So Canarel in Mexico um, declined very quickly. Uh, within a decade, it had gone from one of the world's largest fields to essentially at 25% of the production it was before. Um, Guar in Saudi Arabia is the world's largest oil field. Uh, most analysts at this point, Matthew Simmons wrote this book, Twilight in the Desert, um, he famously predicting the peak of this. A lot of people think essentially that this, this field is peaked. When that happens, um, it's, it's a really important date because it pulls everything else with it. So, Right now, we get about a third of the world's oil from these fields right here. Um, if they're peaked, that's a big deal because it means that we need to quickly ramp up other sources of energy to make up for this lost uh, oil production. Uh, global discoveries have peaked. So every year, uh, geologists go out and go look for oil fields. Um, and every year, they find them. So you'll see this in the newspaper. Uh, every couple of you know, months, there will be a huge oil find or what seems to be huge, because what's happened is since essentially the 1960s, the, the amount of oil discovered every year has gone down and down and down. So when they, when they you know, announce huge fields like the Tupi field in Brazil, they may seem really big, but they're nothing compared to the huge mega fields that we were finding back in the 60s. So what's, what's happening here is essentially Oil production globally, because of population increase and because of uh, our inability to increase the rate of, of global oil production, it's essentially become a zero-sum game. Since the 1970s, if you look at oil production per person, so this is if, if you just divided all of the oil production uh, equally amongst every single person on Earth, how much oil would each person get? And it's essentially four barrels, <laughs> four and a half barrels per person per year. It do doesn't sound like a lot because you know, a, a large, large percentage of the world is, is living in poverty and it really is using a hell of a lot less than 4.5 barrels per day. But what's happening is we've been ramping up oil production, but we've also been ramping up the population. So we've, we've been essentially at a, at a zero sum since 1970s. And what's going to happen when, when oil peaks, when the global production rate peaks and population continues to increase, is this is going to go down. It's going to put enormous pressures. Um, on our ability to, to essentially feed people and keep everybody in, in the kind of lifestyle that we're at right now. Um, you know, in order to increase your own energy use, uh, you're essentially going to have to take it away from somebody else. Uh, so that's, that's a zero-sum game with a shrinking pie, just the forces get worse and worse and worse. Um, so the fields that we're, you know, discovering now, bring online now to try to replace these large old oil fields. Um, unfortunately, the, the newer fields, they peak earlier and they peak faster. Um, so this is the post-production decline rate of these fields based on the year that we started production with them. Um, it's, globally, it's about 6, six to 7% uh, 
post peak decline rate, but it's gone up and up and up with the fields that we're that we're getting now. When you get into um, unconventional sources like uh, shale, shale oil, fracking for shale oil, um, it declines extremely fast and it declines extremely early. It, early as in within a couple of years of starting production as opposed to a couple of decades of starting production uh, with the oil field, with the larger, older mega fields. So that's where we're at right now. It's, uh, what, what's going to have to happen is that we're going to have to substitute over for other, other sources of oil. Um, and one point I want to make abundantly clear here is that we are, we are essentially talking about peak oil, which is a, a liquid fuel. It creates liquid transportation fuels. Um, electricity is not a ready substitute for liquid transportation fuels. We can switch over our cars to electric cars, but we're never going to run airplanes on anything except oil or, or you know, biofuels. Um, and, and there's limits with substitutes for that. So what we're really talking about here is liquid transportation fuels, not electricity. That being said, switching over to electrification, this will happen. We will have to switch over a tremendous amount of our transportation infrastructure to electrification. But what's going to happen is it's going to be very, very difficult to do this. Um, the average car in the US is on the road now for 10 years. A decade ago, this was 8.8 8 .8 years. So people are keeping their cars longer, largely due to the fact that the cars are more reliable today. Um, you know, we're in a recession, so people aren't buying new cars. Uh, and, what, and what this means is with a 5% with scrappage rate, so this is, you know, cars being crashed and so forth that go to the scrapyard, which is the current scrappage rate in the US, it would take 20 years to turn over our entire fleet of automobiles. And so this means that if, if today, if every single person bought an electric car uh, as their new car, it would take 20 years for us to switch over from internal combustion cars to electric. Um, now, the, U the US actually isn't nearly as important as the Chinese auto market, which surpassed the US in the last two years. Uh, we sell about 15 million cars a year. Um, they sell 18.5 million cars per year. And out of those, 0.01% of them are electric. Um, so they, and, and they are because they're buying brand new cars as opposed to you know, scrapping, they're not scrapping their cars nearly as fast as we are. Their turnover rate is a lot slower. It's probably a few more years longer than this. So it's going to take a very, very long time to switch over to electrification of transportation. Building high speed trains and so forth is very difficult politically getting the right of ways, um, getting the permits and everything to build the track to put these in. Uh, as, we, as we see, just trying to get electrification of rail done in the US, it's very difficult. So for the time being, we are still talking about liquid transportation fuels. And that means we're going to have to switch over to substitute forms of oil. We're going to essentially peak conventional oil, and we're going to have to bring on a whole lot of other types of unconventional oil. Um, and this is really sort of the final frontiers of oil. We're getting into ultra deep water offshore. This is greater than 10,000 feet of water depth with um, the Brazilian uh, 2P field, which is what's known as subsalt. So you have you know, a mile of water and then a couple miles of salt. You're essentially drilling six to seven miles worth of pipe just to get to the oil um, in you know, a few thousand, 10,000 feet of water. So this is, this is really the, the absolute final frontier of, of drilling. Um, we're now getting into Arctic oil, so drilling um, north of Norway right now in the Barents Sea, drilling north of Alaska in the, in the Beaufort Sea, uh, north of Canada, so in the Chukchi Sea. These, these are going on right now. Um, and in sort of an ironic twist, due to global climate change, there's less and less sea ice every year in the Arctic. Eventually, within maybe a decade or two, there's going to be no sea ice in the Arctic which ironically means we can drill a lot more oil up there and you know, create more global warming. Um, and and what's, what's happening, though, is that you, you can only really drill in the summer now. Um, so you only get a few months of drilling. It's really risky. If you get a blowout um, in, let's say, September, it might be you know, April by the time you're able to get back and stop the blowout. So um, it's really risky. This is, this is literally the final frontier of oil. Uh, of conventional oil drilling. There is also oil drilling going on in politically sensitive areas. So this is Central Africa, um, Iraq, uh, and, and these, are, these still have 
large conventional um, oil fields. But you, know, you start drilling in some dictatorship in Central Africa, and you pay billions of dollars uh, to be able to start drilling there, the next month the dictator might decide, oh, sorry, it's my oil again, and you lose everything. So these, these are very difficult areas to drill in. Um, nationalizations of oil companies are happening right now. We, have, we saw it this week happen in Argentina. Argentina decided to take back YPF from Repsol, uh, which owns it in Spain. Um, this has been happening with, with oil company nationalizations and it will continue to happen. This makes it very difficult to, to drill in these areas. Um, then there's heavy oil. So this is Athabasca tar sands, Anaranco heavy crudes, um, Rocky Mountain shale. Um, uh, we have shale oil up, up in North Dakota. Um, th these, I'll get into this in a second, how difficult this is to drill in these. Um, but this is a, you know, another final frontier, biofuels. You can convert natural gas to liquids. And you can convert coal to liquids, um, which is what the Nazis did in World War II. It's what um, South Africa did during apartheid. Um, if you really have to, you can, you can turn coal into liquid transportation fuels. So first, the engineering limits to these substitutes. Um, as I was describing, there's immense complexity, immense cost to drilling offshore in ultra-deep water. Um, the rigs to drill in these, in these ultra-deep water places, they essentially cost five to six hundred million dollars for the rig. Um, the day rate to rent one of these rigs is about five hundred thousand dollars a day. Once you get uh, you know, all the other uh, companies on board like Halbert and Schlumberger and all the service companies, it costs about a million dollars a day uh, to drill in these ultra deep water. Um, with, with Arctic oil, uh, there's, there's the same immense complexity and cost, but then there's the inability to drill in the winter and there's the problems with, as I mentioned, blowouts in the winter. But you, it's, you have to have teams um, around to be able to you know, mitigate these risks. You have to pay a lot more money to have ships that are um, capable to drill in these waters. Heavy oil, uh, just from a strict engineering standpoint, is, is limited by the scale of water and natural gas availability. Um, converting uh, heavy, like uh, Canadian tar sands, it's not oil, it's bitumen. And you have to take that, you have to heat it up, convert it to a synthetic oil, which then is essentially still heavy sour crude that you have to then take to a refinery that can handle that kind of heavy sour crude. So it's extremely expensive. It's limited by the refining capability. It's limited by the transportation capability. So this is why we had the, the huge um, issue with Keystone XL this past year. Uh, there's a lot of unconventional oil coming out of North Dakota and Canada but we aren't able to transport it to the refineries down in Louisiana and Mississippi that have the heavy uh, sour crude refining capacity. So um, there are all kinds of engineering limits to bringing this production up, which essentially means that as we get a global peak in production and try to replace it with all these other forms of, of energy, we may not be able to replace it fast enough. That's, that's really the key to all this. When also, you know, because of all this complexity, because of all this cost, as we switch over to alternative forms of unconventional oil, they get more and more and more expensive. Um, so this is, when you hear people talk about the end of cheap oil, this is what they mean. We're not replacing conventional oil with cheaper forms of oil. We're replacing it with more expensive forms of oil. And this means oil for well into the future will just get more and more expensive. And it, yeah, and, and transportation and so forth, yeah. Um, environmental limits, so these, these are probably more important than the engineering limits to, to these uh, unconventional resources. With ultra deep water, you have the risk of blowouts, same with Arctic <coughs> oil. Um, if you're drilling in you know, Central Africa, they probably don't have very strict environmental laws. So that's an environmental uh, risk right there. You have, with heavy oil, um, massive water pollution. So this is a picture that was taken from the International Space Station of the tailing ponds in Alberta. Um, the ponds are many, many square miles of, of essentially um, water pollution coming off of, of, the, of the heavy oil um, production. And it's, so they're so big that, that they basically are running out of space <laughs> to create these tailing ponds. They're so huge, you can see them from space. Um, there's also just much, much higher greenhouse gas emissions from these. Uh, 
from all of these, so that's the next slide here, is the carbon intensity of these alternatives. Um, to get tar sands out, you have to, as I mentioned, heat them up, and that requires natural gas. And so it's not just convert, it's not just taking the oil out of the ground and refining it. You have to take the oil out of the ground, put a tremendous amount of energy into it, and then refine it. By the time you're done with that, you've put way more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. Um, once you start getting into things like cold liquids, it gets really bad from a greenhouse gas standpoint. Um, just going back real fast to electrical substitutes. So there's all kinds of challenges switching over to electrical. Um, if we, if we want to you know, use nuclear, it takes 10 years to get a permit, basically. Uh, wind, you know, there's issues with people don't want wind in their, in their backyard. Uh, gas fracking, you, we live in Ithaca, you, you walk around, you're going to see these no frack signs everywhere. Uh, people are very opposed to natural gas um, fracking. And then with coal, um, I'll get into this with peak everything, but we're getting into pretty desperate ways of, of getting coal out of the ground, things like mountaintop removal. Um, putting in this capacity of renewable energy, uh, wind and solar, so it's not sunny at night and uh, the wind doesn't always blow, so that's intermittency. Uh, and then variability, you know, sometimes clouds come by and it's not so sunny, and sometimes the wind doesn't blow very hard, and that's variability. You have to take into account the intermittency and variability of these resources, and what it means is you have to have a far larger base load capacity of your electrical grid in order to take up this, this essentially spring of electricity that's coming in. Um, and then there's location availability. So with wind, there's only, there's only so many good places to put wind turbines, there's only so many, you know, mountaintops that have high wind. Um, and with, with hydro, we've essentially used up every single river we can. We've dammed up every, every good hydro uh, river on Earth, basically, at this point. Um, so th there's huge limits to ramping up our electricity production if we're going to try to offset the amount of energy that we're using from oil by electrifying our transportation. And there's limits from peak everything. So. Um, I'll get into peak everything in a second, but there's resource shortages, so it takes energy to get things like copper, rare earth metals, um, and so forth out of the ground. Uh, if you want to put in more wind turbines, you need more neodymium to, ha to have for the uh, electric motors in, or the electric generators in the wind turbines. So um, when the energy costs increases to extract those resources, it means the energy, or it means the, the cost of those materials that go into the alternative forms of energy increases, which increases the cost of those electricity forms. So this creates sort of a feedback loop, um, what's, what's known as a reseeding horizon. It gets, it gets more and more expensive uh, to put in these alternative forms of energy. Um, and essentially, as, as you know, we switch over to other forms of energy, they start competing against each other which causes a cascade of peaks. So once we reach peak oil, we're going to have to use more and more gas. That's going to push the peak of gas sooner. We're going to have to use more and more gas, which means that we're going to have to use more and more coal. That pushes the peak of coal earlier. So you get cascading peaks once you hit uh, peak oil, essentially. This is the net energy returned from alternatives. Right now, um, conventional oil back in the 1970s, we got something like 35 barrels of oil worth uh, or barrels of oil for every barrel of oil worth of energy we burned. Um, today we're getting about 25 barrels of oil back for every oil, barrel of oil we burn. When you start getting into things like biofuels, you, they can actually be net energy negative. You're burning more energy to get the energy back out of biofuels. Things like tar sands are below 10 to 1, um, which, which isn't very good for, for an energy source because you're burning so much energy at that point to try to get energy back. So peak everything. So <laughs> you can think of any non-finite, any finite non-renewable natural resource can follow essentially the same curve as oil does. Um, we, we, we ramp up production and eventually we reach some kind of limit of production and it starts declining as we run out of that resource or, or as the resource starts getting more and more expensive to use. So peak oil, um, is the same type of thinking can go into peak gas, can go into peak coal, you can think about peak minerals, things like uh, peak uranium extraction, 
peak metals like uh, you know peak copper, peak aluminum, peak uh, rare earth metals, whatever you want to think about. And the sort of scary side of this is peak food. So soil, for all intents and purposes, is a finite non-renewable natural resource because it takes between 200 and 1,000 years to create one inch of topsoil, and we're depleting it about 40 times faster than, than we're creating new topsoil. So you can get peak soil. You can get peak water. Um, underground aquifers that aren't naturally, that, so underground aquifers, you can think of the same way as, as soil. They are replenished as it rains, but if you're extracting water from them faster than they're being replenished, then, then you can get a peak in the amount of water you get. These are extremely localized. Natural gas peak is extremely localized as well because it's very difficult to transport soil or transport water or transport gas. Um, but things like fish, uh, we, you can re reach a peak in fish and fertilizer so we can reach, we use natural gas right now. About half of the world's fertilizer comes from uh, the fischer trous process which takes natural gas and turns it into um, ammonium which then goes into ammonium nitrate uh, fertilizers that we use worldwide. Phosphate rock, potash, um, we use these for nitrogen fixing in, uh, in fields and these can become, these can peak as well. So let's start with peak gas. This is the US um, production uh, curve for gas. What you see is we were essentially tapering off in conventional gas, but we got a nice spike out of uh, fracking. So we've been able to greatly increase the amount of gas over the last couple of years that we're getting from, uh, from fracking, basically. This is why gas has, you know, prices have fallen so much is because we've ramped up production so much. Um, the problem with this is it's essentially a treadmill that's just going faster and faster and faster. We have, th this is the EIA basically says that these, these fracked wells peak earlier and they peak faster. It's the same thing we see with the newer oil fields. Um, what, what happens is as, as we deplete the conventional resources and try to replace it with these unconventional gas resources, we're, we're essentially having to put more and more and more drilling every year just to be able to replace um, the, the production lost. So eventually this will peak as well. Uh, most experts say the gas peak probably is about 10 to 15 years past the oil peak globally. Uh, already we've had a bunch of countries re reach uh, peak gas, so the UK um, reached peak gas, Germany, and so forth, and they're about at, at production rates that are about half what they were at the production peak. Peak coal, um, coal resources, you can think of them as uh, the richness of, of the seam that you're, that you're extracting. Um, this is million BTUs per short ton, so this is how much energy for every ton of rock you're taking out is, is burnable energy. And in the US it's been declining steadily ever since we started um, producing coal. And it's the same, same with every single coal reserve on Earth. Um, you, you start out with the really nice big seams of, of coal and then they start getting thinner and thinner and thinner. There's more and more rock per ton. You get less and less energy out of each ton of, of coal that you're extracting. What's really interesting is that because of technology, for essentially the last century, we've been able to get more rock per person. So for every coal miner, you're able to get more and more rock out of the ground because they're using machines, you know, they're using <coughs> all kinds of new techniques. But since 2000, this has actually peaked. So now we're having to add more and more people just to get more and more tons of rock out of the ground that have less and less energy. And so what this means is we've peaked coal in the US in Appalachia already. We're making up for it right now with Wyoming coal, but in, in the US, let me take some water here, um, we peaked in Appalachian coal in 1997. And so just like peak oil, just like peak gas, a lot of countries around the world have already peaked their coal production. Germany um, peaked back in, what is it, 1985. The UK, famous for essentially starting the coal revolution, starting the industrial revolution because of coal, inventing the steam engine to get more coal out of the ground, they peaked back in 1981. And they are way off what they were when they were producing their peak. They're at 85% uh, off their, their peak in coal production. So just like peak oil, just like uh, peak gas, we'll see peaks in coal worldwide. Eventually these will aggregate up to a global peak in coal production. <clears throat> 
And so what this means is, at least in the US, after you reach peak coal, coal companies start, and get a, start getting a little desperate. Um, Massey Coal, which has just done some really controversial <laughs> things, they, they were doing a whole lot of mountaintop removal in, in Appalachia, which is basically you take a mountain and blow it up and essentially take the whole top of the mountain off to be able to get to the coal because that is a cheaper form of, of extracting coal than it is tunneling into the mountain. They've also done things, this, this is one that they're um, particularly well known for, putting a 2.8 billion gallon coal slurry pond right above an elementary school in Appalachia. So this kind of, this kind of desperate uh, coal extraction wouldn't be happening if we hadn't reached a peak in, in coal production. If there were still abundant coal resources, we wouldn't have to do things like mountaintop removal. Peak metals, um, same, same story as with coal. You, when you start extracting, say, copper in a country, you go for the really rich seams that are really close to transportation sources that are really easy to get people and resources to. Um, and then once you've done that, you start getting into you know, s smaller and less rich seams. You go further and further from, from people. It requires more and more energy to get the metals out of the ground. And when that energy starts getting more and more expensive from peak oil, peak coal, peak gas, it means that you're able to get less and less of these resources out of the ground. Um, gold is a great example because the price of gold has gone from about $300 to about $1,600, $1,700 in the last decade. And meanwhile, the production of coal has been pretty much on a plateau since 1990. Uh, or since the 90s. Um, with rare earths, you know, you might have been reading a lot about rare earths in the last few years, especially with uh, China cutting off their export of rare earths uh, to Japan and the US. Um, produ this, because production has plateaued essentially globally, the prices have shot through the roof, um, and, and it's been very difficult for us to replace this. Um, platinum has got, just like gold, has gotten really, really expensive, but it's essentially production globally has peaked in 2007. Um, and copper is plateauing. The, uh, we get the vast majority of our copper from Chile, and they've been, uh, the Chilean uh, Mining Association has basically said that they've peaked at this point. Um, we're gonna have to replace that with other forms of copper, and so this could mean that we get a peak in copper. So you can think about this for any non-renewable non finite resource, any kind of mineral. So then there's peak food. So we burn 10 calories of hydrocarbon fuel in the US for every calorie of food we eat. And this is because we take natural gas to create fertilizer. Uh, we take oil to create pesticides and herbicides. We run uh, farming equipment off of diesel to plow, plant, and harvest the food. Then you take the food on a diesel-powered truck to a production facility that uses coal-fired electricity uh, to process the food and package it in plastics that are made out of oil, which then puts it on a diesel-powered truck and takes it to your grocery store. You get in your gasoline-powered car, go to the grocery store, pick it up, drive your gasoline-powered car home, put it on your natural gas stove, and by the time you're done with all that, you've used 10 calories of hydrocarbon fuel just to feed yourself one calorie of food. Um, so the, the worst of, the, of, of food, the most energy hungry of these forms of food is, is obviously meat. Um, it takes six barrels of oil to raise one steer, and every single form of meat is net, net energy negative. Um, there, this runs the gamut from chicken, which isn't so bad, to things like feedlot beef, which requires a tremendous amount of energy for the amount of uh, protein calories you get back from it. Um, so what we see, what we see because of this, uh, because you know, f so much energy is required for food, is that the correlation between food and energy is 0.99. So food is energy, energy is food, and what this means is when prices go up for energy, prices go up for food. This is what we've seen uh, in the last five to ten years. Food prices have gone through the roof. Some people have even blamed the food prices on the Arab Spring revolts, um, which were started when uh, a Tunisian fruit vendor lit himself on fire protesting the rise in food prices. It, it's, it's really causing a lot of trouble um, politically around the world right now. 
but it's all essentially due to energy costs rising. Um, peak fish, so this is, we've seen a lot of fishery collapses worldwide. Um, cod most famously collapsed uh, back in, when was this, the 60s, 70s? Um, and you know, Chilean sea bass, king crab, these have all, uh, these have all collapsed worldwide. And once, once you've collapsed a fishery, um, studies, there's studies that have looked at 15 years out after, after a fishery collapse, and it's something like 80 to 90 percent of fisheries don't ever recover after a fishery collapse. So um, things like global shrimp and prawn, which are, we, we, you know, we create, uh, where we, we harvest three million tons every year of, of shrimp and prawn globally, um, they may have peaked back in 2003. So, so billions of people require or, or rely on these forms of food um, for their, their protein intake every year. And once we start peaking out the production, once we start getting fishery collapses worldwide, it really reduces the amount of food that's available to everybody. So this is a chart I have in the book. <laughs> it's a little complex, but it looks at all the different um, forces that are acting on higher food prices. You, it, it all really comes down to the fact that we're increasing global uh, population and per capita resource use, but which causes essentially peak oil. Then you, other ha you have other um, forces acting on this, like climate change, which is uh, you know causing droughts and floods and and crop failures. Um, peak soil. So as I mentioned before, peak so soil is is essentially, for all intents and purposes, a, a non-renewable resource because of the vast time scale it takes to replenish it. Um, it could take a thousand years to create one inch of, of topsoil and we're, cur we're currently globally, depending on the region, um, extracting or, or depleting our soil about 10 to 40 times faster than, than we're renewing it. So uh, this is you know, create, creating enormous pressure uh, uh, globally on, on food prices. Um, all these act together. It means that food prices go up and it essentially can mean that people get priced out of the food market, that food, food becomes too expensive for, for people. We start getting malnutrition and, and starvation and those kind of things. Okay, so that's, that's, the, that's the bad news. Um, <laughs> we had, so what, is, what does this all mean? Are, are, are we going to get you know, into a Mad Max situation where we're all killing each other over the remaining oil? Or is it going to be like the Jetsons where we all uh, switch over to renewable energy and drive around in our electric cars and everything's great? Are we going to get high-speed trains, you know, or, or are we going to get economic dis depressions and resource wars? Um, I'm more of an optimist. I think it's going to be somewhere in the middle. This is, you have to remember when you get a peak in supply, it always has, supply and demand always have to meet. So peak oil supply is going to mean peak oil demand globally. The prices will force down our demand, and this will mean that we're going to start getting more efficient with our energy use. We're going to have to switch over to alternatives. And so that while this may cause oil price spikes and corresponding recessions and basic materials are going to get more expensive, um, we are going to get efficiency improvements. We're going to start electrifying our transportation. Uh, and we are going to start switching over to this, but it's not going to be easy. So final slide, what can you do? <coughs> um, these are just some recommendations of, of, you know, when if you're thinking about this, what can you do in your life? Live in a walkable neighborhood. If you can uh, live in a place where you can uh, walk or bike to work or take public transportation, um, it means that you're less uh, susceptible to oil shocks and, and you don't have to drive a car um, to be able to just run your day-to-day -day life. Um, if you can buy a more fuel-efficient car, do it. If you can buy a plug-in hybrid, even better. Uh, in your community, um, think about joining a sustainability group. There's some, there's some great, um, essentially, peak oil awareness groups known as the transition movement. Um, the, you know, this, this is a, a good way to sort of meet people and sort of learn more about these issues. Politically, um, you want to vote for people that understand this issue. If people if, if a politician is basically saying we don't have a problem, which luckily almost no politician says that we don't have an energy problem. Um, but if you, if you get a politician that's saying that, you know, we're going to become energy independent in 10 years with <laughs> the amount of increase in oil production, that's, that's just not true because of the limits on, on the increase of, of the production rate for these things. So 
Um, you, you know, vote for politicians who understand the issue, are thinking about sustainable solutions, but at the same time, you, you want, you know, we, we need politicians that are also helping us increase our all forms of energy. So this is politically known as an all across the board energy policy. We need, we need policies that help us increase all forms of energy um, so that we don't get into huge problems when we start peaking with oil. Um, career, think about your role, think about the industry that you're gonna work in. A lot of industries are gonna disappear. Don't go work for an airline. They are, um, I, I actually had a chat with the head of um, transportation for the, for the World Bank and he was saying that, uh, he, I mean, he was talking about peak oil and he, and he talked about airlines for quite a while saying that they're essentially, they're essentially gonna go bankrupt, they're gonna get squeezed out of all this. So. Um, and then personal finance, you can invest and make a lot of money. This is probably the greatest investment opportunity of our, of our lifetimes, um, which is why I'm writing a book on it. So buy my book. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I've got a few myself, so I'll let you direct it. Yeah. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, one of the nine neodymium? Ne neodymium is, is um, a rare earth metal that's used to make um, ma magnets, and, and so it goes into permanent magnet motors, which are um, very high efficiency motors that are used in things like uh, Toyota Prius uses neodymium uh, for their motors. Yeah, so actually I talk about that quite a bit in the book. Um, what's going on right now with, with the global land grab is um, countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, um, China, uh, South Korea, Japan, they're all, they're all putting government money in the, either in the forms of loan guarantees like in China or in the form of direct cash in the form of Saudi Arabia to buy up land in Africa, South America, um, parts of Asia, Eastern Europe is a huge place right now where a lot of investment, particularly private equity investment in the U.S. is going into buying up land um, in places like, uh, you know, Romania and, and Ukraine. Um, that it's, it's, it's a major issue uh, right now is, is because people are worried about their food supply. You know, there's no agricultural land essentially in Saudi Arabia. They're worried about their food supply. They're taking all their oil money and buying land so that they have a supply of food for the eight million people that live, live in Saudi Arabia right now. So that's, that's happening. It's uh, a lot of hedge funds are investing in this because um, the return on farmland is higher than the market return right now. So, um, but it also means that we could get into a position where people are starving in Africa while uh, the food is going to rich Saudi princes or, you know, something like that. Yep. So what are the naysayers say, like the opponents of, of peak oil and, and not, like people who are half, halfway in the market? So, so the, the general arguments against peak oil, the, the, most, the most commonly used one is the market will solve the problem. That the <laughs> solution to high prices is high prices. As, as price of oil goes up, we're gonna, you know, it makes it economical to start um, investing in other forms of, of uh, drilling, other forms of energy, energy production. Um, but, it, but as I talked about with, you know, all the substitutes, these are really difficult to ramp up. So yes, they will definitely, we will definitely keep, you know, producing tar sands and keep producing, um, you know, Venezuelan heavy crude and all, the, all these other forms of, of oil, but they get more expensive and there's a possibility we won't be able to offset the decline from the conventional uh, oil production globally. Um, other, I mean, if you, read, if you read a lot of the arguments against uh, peak oil, one of the most common is that, you know, this is just boy who cried wolf, um, that we've, we, how many people in the past have said we're running out of oil? Um, well, I hate to say this time is <laughs> different because I'm, I, you know, I'm on tape. I might be one of these people that, that, and you know, you, 20 years from now, say, oh, he was wrong too. But w right now, you know, we are at the point. Maybe we won't reach a peak in, in global production soon, but we're definitely getting into way more expensive forms of of, of energy. Um, so 
It might not be peak oil right now, but we're at least at the end of cheap oil. Um, so what, what substitutes do you want to hear about? Um, so maybe Denmark and what they with, with wind? Yeah. Okay. And, and that ramp up has been fairly quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or also, you know, so nuclear is coming offline for Germany. What does that mean in terms of, you know, lots of places won't invest in nuclear because of what, what happened in Fukushima. So, I mean, that yeah. makes it worse for substitutes in one way and then there's also some maybe positives in terms of your ability to ramp up. So, so yeah, Denmark's done a great job ramping up wind, obviously. Um, they're at about a third of their energy, I think, right now comes from wind. Um, that is maybe the limit that you can put on a grid because... 30%. 30%. Many, many studies show that 30% is all you can handle today. Yeah. Cheap storage. Yeah, so we, we, we don't have a way... Um, pumped water storage, cheap storage. We don't... Obviously, there's, there's no mountains, so you can't... In, in Denmark, you can't do pumped water storage. So... Um, because of the inner, oh, pump, so pumped water storage, uh, there's, I don't know, we do it a lot of places worldwide, and when I was living in St. Louis, they had, they had one in Missouri. You essentially take, you have two, you have two lakes, um, one's at a higher elevation than the other. Uh, during the day, when you have a lot of electricity demand, you run the water from the top lake to the bottom lake through a turbine, create electricity, send it out to the grid. At night, when electricity's really cheap, demand's really low, you reverse that, you essentially re reverse that turbine, pump the water back up to the, the storage lake, um, and it creates a cycle that is essentially is a giant battery. Um, you can only do that in certain places because you need a huge elevation change um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way to essentially create, dam up uh, an area, um, both the top and the bottom. So. Yeah. So they're working on that, but but still, it's hard to get over thirty percent right now. Yeah. And and it, and it comes back to what I talked about the fungibility of substitutes. That oil is not electricity, and what we're what we need most right now is liquid transportation fuels to run our airplanes, to run um, our gasoline powered cars, and so forth. Um, it ramping up wind isn't going to solve that problem directly unless we start electrifying our transportation. Yeah. You mentioned that so many people who don't believe this are using markets as the, or saying markets will solve it so there's nothing to worry about. Yeah. So where do you think the market is failing or what's being mispriced that makes you maybe not well, look bad? You know, in, in a perfect market, um, the, the high prices would solve the problem um, over the sort of shorter run over a couple decades. Um, even, even with that, over you know, a hundred year time scale, we will obviously peak in oil production just because it is a finite resource. Um, in the near term, perfect markets would sort of bring more, more oil on, onto the market, um, but we don't live in a perfect market. There's political issues, um, there's technical uh, engineering issues, there's environmental issues, so um, th those aren't really handled well with, with classic economics, you know, economics tries to, tries to take those market anomalies and call them externalities and, and try, to <laughs> try to build them into the classic economic model, but um, unfortunately, it's not very easy to substitute over, and all the money in the world can't really help increase um, oil production beyond the, the limits of our environment and the limits of, of engineering and politics. Coal situation and peak coal, the idea of peak coal is complicated. 
One is environmental regulation uh, of electric power plants, which use, use the bulk of coal as it goes to electric power plants. Um, and, and so regulation has shifted demand to low sulfur coal. It turned out to be cheaper than buying control equipment. And so that's a very complicated story. But, but today, they're talking about shutting, shutting down the plant of the lake because natural gas prices are so cheap. So that's the other factor, mm -hmm. that natural gas has become so cheap that it's kind of driving coal out. So, so it might be more peak demand than... Yeah, it might be a more demand-driven. Dri yeah. uh, and my understanding of, the, of coal reserves <clears throat> are that there's quite a bit out there. So I don't know if we've reached peak coal yet. That yeah. may be 50 years in the future or something. I just don't know. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, you know, I'm just speculating harder to make the case that we've reached a peak in, in coal production. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's, I don't know the answer. Well, and, and I, I think most experts would say that, you know, peak gas follows peak oil and peak coal follows peak gas, exactly. and there's probably a decade or two decades in between each of those peaks. So what's, what's worrisome right now is peak oil. Peak coal and peak gas will happen eventually, but they're not, they're not as much to be worried about as, as oil is.